I like to think of the Singularity, Singularity University as sort of uh, the Wharton School for Disruptive Technology. Uh, it's been a great privilege to know these people over the years. Uh, and I'm very excited uh, about the areas they're working in. I'm very excited about the future. I'm excited about the future because that's where I'm going to spend the rest of my life, as somebody a lot smarter than me once said. I'm excited about genomics. I'm excited about nanotechnology. I'm excited about robotics. I'm particularly excited about machine learning and artificial intelligence. Have you noticed? The ship has come in on artificial intelligence. We've been dealing with this for 20 years, talking about it. Kurzweil has been the thought leader in it. But this year, in 2015, it just suddenly blew up. It permeated the general media discussions. All right, some of the discussions were a little inane sometimes and a little silly. But the fact is, the technology has evolved to a point where a lot of smart thought leaders have noticed it. In other words, law of accelerating returns really does work. And we saw it here in the zeitgeist last year around artificial intelligence. A particularly profound moment occurred during the Go battle with Google's DeepMind. I think it was the second uh, uh, contest, the second game, the reigning Go champion said that the machine made a move that did not make sense to him, that was not in any way comprehensible at all. Only later, when the game was at its end, did the player realize that that move was very profound, that it threw him off, and that it was largely responsible for winning the game. The Go player said that it was beautiful when he finally understood it. Now, Something happened there. Okay, I don't want to get too anthropomorphic about this and trying to describe some kind of human quality to what the machine was doing, but something very profound happened there. And I believe 40 years from now, when the history of artificial intelligence is written, and it will be written by an artificial intelligence, by the way, I think that will be cited as a very profound moment. My point is, a lot of stuff is happening, and it's starting to happen faster. It's all happening a lot like Ray describes it. Now, fintech, financial technology. A lot has changed in the last few years since this conference started. I want to highlight where we are and maybe a little bit about where we're going right now. First thing is the investment end of this thing, which is a lot of what we cover uh, at CNBC, is growing very fast. Investments in private fintech, $1.8 billion in 2010, 2015, $19 billion. Now, I'm going to be citing some numbers from Citigroup. They did a very good, I think, and I read a lot of this stuff, very good analysis of the current state of fintech in a March report here uh, that I think did very good, very nice job of summarizing, and I'm going to show you some of the uh, statistics here uh, from them. What's driving fintech is very, very simple. Maintaining control of the customer relationship. You really don't have to understand more than that. We know what happened in other technologies that were disrupted by, by digital innovation. They lost control of the customer. Ask the music business what happened. The banks do not want to lose control of the customer relationship or lose the customers at all. So making it as smooth and effortless as possible is really key, but keeping the customers is the main issue. Another thing that's secondary but very important is in a world of low growth, uh, low rates, low profitability, cutting costs is critical. In fact, it's the primary way that earnings have been growing for corporate America for the last six or seven years, certainly since the financial crisis. So bear in mind, cost cutting is a critical issue as well. Okay, where are we going? There's three or four areas where we're seeing the obvious moves. First is mobile money, and this is where the big efforts have been going, and it's growing fast in your money transfer, in your mobile banking, and in your payment processing in particular. Consumer lending has also what we call peer to peer lending, P2P lending has been taking off. You've heard a lot about Lending Club and Prosper and, and, and SoFi out there. Uh, small business lending is also doing okay. Circle Up, Cabbage, On Deck, these are companies we've had on already. Uh, I think the problem here is the growth has been a lot slower than certainly in mobile money here. There's funding capacity issues around that, and these are areas where bank collaboration is a lot more likely. I'll talk about that in a minute. Then we have personal finance management. The, this is largely but not exclusively around robo advisors like Betterment and Wealthfront, who've already been here in past conferences to talk, uh, what they are discovering, uh, and th again, we're, we're now into this, this uh, fintech revolution, uh, is that it's
it's a, more difficult than a lot of people thought to build brands and build trust and build relationship. I'll talk about some of the uh, issues around that just just a moment here. One of the amazing things, if you just look at one of these things, the personal finance management area, it's amazing what the potential is for them. We haven't even scratched the surface in this. So let me just show you this. The global mutual fund business is about $30 trillion. The global ETF industry, a, a sort of subset of it, but it's, it's, a, it's a different area, uh, is about two point six trillion, about two trillion in the United States. So you add this up, it's like thirty two, thirty three trillion dollars. The robo advisor business is twenty billion dollars right now. That, uh, under management. Th this is less than one tenth, less than one tenth of one percent of the current market. This just gives you an idea. I'm just picking one aspect of fintech right now here. Let me show you another aspect of it: peer to peer lending, P two P lending here. Uh, even here, if you look at lending volumes, there's a lot of different ways you can slice and dice this stuff. And this is a Citigroup number here. Uh, it's small so far. 2015, it's only 0.7% of the cumulative lending volumes. In, in 2018, it's projected to be 3%. That's a Citigroup estimate. Now, a lot of people constantly drag in China as the fintech leader in the world. And actually, it is, but you've got to be careful what you're comparing here. So China... Right now, it's 3% of lending volumes is peer-to-peer -peer lending. It's expected to go to 9%. You can see they're, they're ahead of us by a notable number here. China is the world leader in fintech right now. I'm just going to take Alibaba here. Okay, This is an e-commerce. Again, this is different than peer-to-peer -peer lending. We're moving around a little bit here. But just to give you an idea of the scale of what they're dealing with, Alibaba is 350 million users. The U.S. population is 310 million. Okay? They have more users than we have people in the United States. The gross merchandise value, which is a sort of rough way of measuring how much they're moving around every year, is about $500 billion. That's the GDP of Norway. That's the GDP of Austria right now. So it's very important to understand the potential numbers that are out there. And this is all done through e-commerce, a, a sort of subset of, of fintech, you could say. Alipay, which is their... Uh, uh, e-commerce, their payment processing arm, is far and away the biggest processing arm in the world here. And this is the key. It's completely integrated. You can spend, you can use Alipay to buy a stick of gum in a store. You can use it to go on vacation anywhere. You can pay utility bills. You can get a loan from a, a, a peer if you want. And it's accepted virtually everywhere in China. We don't have that here. So be careful when everybody says, oh, China's way ahead of us. There's a lot of differences. The U.S. has always had a much more developed banking system. We've always had a much broader, deeper customer base, deeper relationships than any of the Chinese banks, which are relatively new, at least on the scale of the history of the U.S. banking systems. Another important difference is the money transfer processes are very different. We have many different technologies in the United States to move money around. They don't talk to each other. In China, there's really only two or three because they leapfrog the technology, essentially. Just like the, uh, in many uh, uh, African countries, they never laid any wires for telephones. They went directly to cell phones. China leapfrogged this. So yes, they're the leader, but there's some very important differences right now. So here's the big question. Where is the tipping point where these technologies start to really dominate what's going on in fintech. So we know what digital disruption has done to other businesses. You know what it did to music sales and video rentals, uh, real, uh, travel agents, uh, the newspaper business. Could this happen in fintech where you get these massive disruptions? Well, the answer is yes. And the question is, how does it, how do we know what's happening? There is, there's very different ways of looking at this. But one thing that I've noticed is once a technology starts to get Somewhere in the mid-teens, in terms of its, its penetration, I'm talking 12, 14, 15, 16 percent, when that happens in the, in digitally, it accelerates very, very quickly. Because that's enough for first the early adopters, then you get widespread discussion from people, and it starts moving quicker from there. This happened in all these industries around that point. And by the way, it's happening in retail. This last quarter, when the big retailers, the Macy's of the world, reported at their end of April quarter, they all cited 
Digital sales now in the US, depends on how you look at it, but somewhere around 14, 15, 16% of all retail sales are online now. It's somewhere around there. That's a tipping point, and a lot of retailers this year mentioned this, that they're starting to see some real serious issues. And those who don't have serious online are having problems. They're getting disrupted. They're losing business. So look for it somewhere in the mid-teens here. Uh, we're still in the very early stages of this. Now, again, you can take a lot of different numbers here. I'm taking one particular number. This is the percentage of North American consumer banking revenue that has migrated to digital business models. It's only about 1% right now. Uh, Cities estimating it could grow to 10% in 2020 and 17% in 2023. You see the tipping point? We're going to hit very quickly this area within the next couple of years. It's going to get into the low single teens, and then it'll start moving quicker. So they seem to feel the same thing. So where's the, uh, you know, the Uber moment, uh, as I guess you can call it, this shift to mobile distribution happening? One area is in the bank area. You know, I have been hearing for 20 years that bank branches are going to go away. It's for 20 years. This was one of the earliest things you could say in 1996 to sound smart is bank branches are history. Nobody's going to go to a bank branch. You know, tel once teller machines came in, everybody said, nobody's going to go to bank branches. You know what happened? Actually, no. Um, we have seen modest declines in bank branches. Bank branches actually peaked in 2007, not 1996, 2007. There's been some modest decline since then, probably in the area of 12 to 15 percent. I don't have the exact number, but we definitely peaked about 10 years ago. But the decline has not been that rapid. Now, the question is, will these new technologies, once you get the, the, the adoption a little heavier, will the bank branches start coming down? Citi estimated that if you get, start getting massive adoption, bank branches could come down anywhere from 20 to 50 percent. Well, that's a big difference. Nobody really knows. M my thought is maybe, but these banks are not going to let those branches go that easy if they can cost justify them by turning their staff into advisory-based roles, where you come in, obviously there's a lot of retraining involved, but if you come into the banks and they're now selling you a whole suite of services that conclude not just mortgages, but personal wealth management, another whole thing, and again, it requires training, they will find the value of those branches are a lot higher than people think. So I'm not necessarily willing to buy into the bank branch thing is going gonna, is gonna to crater yet. They may have a lot of uses uh, to the banks. Um, and remember when we did this three or four years ago, the basic theme was these punk digital disruptors are going to come in and boy, the banks aren't ready for them. So to remain competitive, banks need to get innovation before the fintech companies get scale. That was several, that, that attitude was several years ago. Uh, things have changed a little bit. Uh, the banks are not rolling over on this. The whole environment has changed. Uh, you're going to hear today, I urge you to pay careful attention to Catherine Besant. Uh, who's going to speak later on this afternoon. She is the CTO of Bank of America, and essentially she's one of the people leading the charge for change uh, in the banking industry. Uh, and you'll hear a lot about what she has to say. Nobody, they're not going under, and they are not going to have uh, some uh, digital disruptor with four people on their staff take down Bank of America. That's not going to happen here. Brian Moynihan, the CEO of Bank of America, regularly peppers in commentary about mobile payments. He just made a comment recently, they've processed 16 billion in mobile payments in 2016. There's an exchange out there, it was formed several years ago, but it's really picking up momentum now called Clear Exchange. It's a consortium of banks, look at the members here, Bank of America, JP Morgan, US Bank, Wells Fargo, Capital One, that essentially allow customers to transmit funds to anyone with a US bank account. Does that sound like PayPal? It is PayPal. That's a PayPal competitor. The banks have essentially created a PayPal competitor, and they're going to keep their people in their ecosphere. But you don't have to be such as Bank of America sends to Bank of America. Bank of America, got account Bank of America? Send it anywhere you want. Send money anywhere you want. That's a PayPal competitor. They're not going to roll over. So bear that in mind. The one thing that you should bear in mind is that the profits are, th are lower for the banks, no matter who wins, even if you get digital disruptors coming in, profitability is down because just the efficiencies that the digital technologies provide here. And remember, a lot of the competitors, they're more interested in user growth. The important thing is these disruptors are causing innovations at the banks that the customers are all going to benefit from. That's the good news. It shouldn't be a surprise to you that JP Morgan is not going to crater tomorrow because somebody's come in with a peer-to-peer -peer lending. JP Morgan is going to hire the best people to try to 
understand that model, and if they really feel there's value, they're going to buy a model as well. And you're going to see some consolidation going on in this area. But it's all very exciting. You can say, oh, well, what was that all about? Just a bunch of banks bought everybody. No, outsiders innovated and showed the banks, you better wake up and you better do something. We're in the, we're now woken up stage, and we're really moving on this. On big data. This is why I love big data. So you're a bank, okay? Look at all this data suddenly you have. You have information on a loyalty card. You have information on somebody's social networks. You have purchase data, loan data. You have, may even have browsing habits. What, 15 years ago, nobody knew what to do with this information, but now big data enables you to sort through this and look for patterns. This is absolutely invaluable to a bank. It changes the way they price risk and they look at risk. Peer-to-peer -peer lending, the whole basis of it is big data analytics applied to that, allowing them to price risk in, in ways that nobody could ever do. And it supports faster and more accurate decisions. This is the most obvious nexus here. You're going to hear a lot about blockchain, uh, and particularly tomorrow here. Uh, we all, you know, Bitcoin's kind of unfortunate because Bitcoin is just a cryptocurrency running off the blockchain. It got all this publicity, but it's, it's really, it's marginal interest. What's interesting is the blockchain and the use for it potentially to replace the current payment system, and indeed, anything that requires verification that you own things. This has been a problem for 10,000 years. How do I know I actually got something if it's not in my hand? How do I know I sent that money to Thailand? How do I know that I, tr I, I sold that stock to somebody? How do I know I got that stock? How do I know I actually own that piece of real estate? Well, we have an elaborate system in the stock market called clearing to tell people, oh yeah, you actually did buy that stock. And we have an elaborate title system and, and real estate insurance mechanism that says, oh yeah, we will, don't worry, we guarantee that you did. But the blockchain can bypass all of that. That is truly revolutionary. I'm very, very excited about blockchain technology as much as I am about big data. Those are the two that excite me. Uh, the most. So what's coming? Where are we going here? So peer-to-peer -peer lending and small businesses, these things are already very, very well developed here. Business to business, you don't hear that much about. That seems to be the next wave. There's a little bit of more issue here. Obviously, you're dealing with more money. Uh, you may be dealing with a lot more legal issues involved. I think it's a lot more complex. We can't get into that now, but that's potentially there, but moving a lot slower. There's a third wave that's kind of interesting out there. A number of, uh, of uh, thought leaders have been talking about where it could go from here. Uh, Citigroup called it industrial fintech, so I'll use that for the moment. Basically, it's financial transactions that are incorporated into the internet of things as another wave, uh, another way of extending the fintech revolution here. Call it a Fitbit for your personal life. So, for example, we could go on and on about this, but just two, insurance policies that automatically would adjust depending upon your driving habits. Smart meters in homes. That's all right. You know, we got smart meters in homes. What happens if they negotiate automatically with utilities to send power or take power during lower hours or maybe store power, reduce your utility bills? That's all the potential here when you start getting fintech involved with the internet of things here. So for the Internet of Things really to work and evolve a lot, there's got to be a mechanism to, for an exchange of value. That's what fintech is. So cross fintech with the Internet of Things, you have an explosion of potential uh, new, new, uh, new value uh, for people who are involved in here. Uh, this may sound a little silly. At some point when your refrigerator wants to order milk, it's going to have to pay for it. But you get the point. Cross fintech with the Internet of Things, and you've got a lot of great potential out there. What's a big thing fintech could solve? Well, I'd rather look at this in terms of uh, let's apply this, disrupt the technology, and do something big. When I talk at CNBC, when we talk to people who are CEOs who run companies in the United States, not just publicly traded, but even those that are not publicly traded, the biggest problem, they said, God, it's such a headache, regulation and compliance, and increasingly they're citing cybersecurity. Would there be some application to take big data and apply it to regulatory issues, to find a better way to do regulation and compliance? 
That's a potentially huge, I don't hear a lot about it. It's mentioned occasionally in reports that I see in a sort of a cursory way. But if you want to solve a real big, big issue, if you want to get uh, disruptive technology to solve a big problem in the financial area and fintech, cross fintech, uh, cr uh, cross uh, regulation and compliance with big data. I'd like to see a lot more research on this. I don't have anything brilliant to say about it other than this is a major issue and this is an area where big data can really do something very, very big. All right, what could go wrong with all of this? Stuff is going to go wrong, you know. Nobody's repealing the law of gravity. The first thing everybody should realize is it's just money, okay? And we're just moving money around. I don't care if you have a Pony Express. I don't care if you're writing a check and mailing it. I don't care if you're using a money transfer system. I don't care if you're using the blockchain. I don't care what you're doing. You're just moving money around. And when money moves around, stuff can go wrong. Models can co collapse. Stuff can get stolen. Nobody's repealed any of this. So you have economic downturns. That downturns. That's going to hurt startups. That's going to hurt some of these. It hasn't happened yet, but that's going to hurt people. New lending products, they're going to collapse. Stuff's not going to work. Uh, the thing I'm worried most about is a really high-profile data breach or fraud that happens in some of these younger technologies. It's happened in, uh, in well-known big industrial companies. I can't imagine why it wouldn't happen here. But when that happens, remember, the fintech business is right now, outside of the banks, it's remarkably lightly regulated. It really is incredible. And you're going to see much, if we get some high-profile data breach, you're going to see much more press pressure for regulatory scrutiny. And that could change things as well. So there's plenty of things that could potentially go wrong. Let's not get too Pollyannish about uh, this whole thing. Anybody see what happened to Lending Club recently? Just a little example of that. So Lending Club is a peer-to-peer -peer lender. Um, you know, three, four years ago, everybody loved Lending Club. I love Lending Club. I think it's a brilliant concept. Uh, just recently, this is just a couple months ago, the CEO abruptly resigned. Uh, Lending Club relies, of course, gives loans out to people, but they turn around and sell the loans. Some of the debts that were, they, they priced out were misstated, and the CEO failed to properly disclose an investment. And a very interesting thing happened. The buyers of the loans kind of said no, not all of them, but enough of them so that they had funding problems. So the stock dropped almost 50% in a week, and it hadn't been a big performer to begin with here. So the moral is some fintech looks a lot like old tech. There's nothing completely revolutionary here. You've got people who want loans, and then you've got people who want to buy the loans. If you don't have somebody that wants to buy the loans, you've got a funding problem here. So again, nobody's repealing the laws of gravity here. They had to, the problem was they needed people to have faith in their process that they were buying loans, and there were some issues around that. Now, uh, I think very highly of Lending Club, and I'm, I'm quite sure they're going to survive. But you can see how people get suddenly cold feet around issues, and it pops up and becomes a problem. I want to move on two minutes uh, and before we introduce, uh, bring on uh, uh, Neil. I want to talk about something that's bothering me a lot, uh, and that is the new wave of techno-pessimists that are out there. The country's in a rotten mood. You saw this in the election. So it shouldn't surprise you that there is a corresponding wave of techno-pessimism going on. This is qualitatively different than the where's my jetpack crowd of 15 years ago. Remember those guys? They came on and said, oh, what's, what's going on with a cell phone? I mean, it's not, that's not really a great technological innovation. I mean, it's a phone. We still talk on phones. We had phones 50 years ago. What's the difference? Really? Really? The iPhone is to the... 1960 princess rotary dial, remember that one? The iPhone is to the princess rotary dial as lightning is to the lightning bug, as Mark Twain once said, I'm paraphrasing Mark Twain. You really wanna say, really, to these people? Have you been watching anything that's going on? Let me move on, there's a new wave of them that are out here, led by a very influential professor, Robert Gordon. He's a Northwestern University economist. He is very respected. He has written about the history of economics uh, before, particularly the Industrial Revolution. He has a book out called The Rise and Fall of American Growth, and it's been seized upon by the new wave of techno-pessimists to say, see, all these people, bright new world, it's really not changing that much here. I'm gonna paraphrase his argument very simply here, uh, and it's going to be a short paraphrase. His argument is that demographics, education, 
debt, inequality are major headwinds for economic growth. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. And that you need innovations to offset the headwinds. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. I certainly don't here. He goes through, and this book is 700 pages, it's a quite a slog here, but he looks at the Industrial Revolution, basically, and cites all the things that we love. Electricity, central heating, the internal combustion engine, indoor plumbing, vaccinations. Hey, we all agree, who doesn't like flush toilets? I agree, it changed the world. It definitely did. The problem is where we go with this information from here. So, his main argument, and again, I'm simplifying a little bit, is that innovations since 1970 have been less transformative than the, rest, the Industrial Revolution. This is a sort of variation on the where's my jetpack crowd. Uh, and that innovation that we are seeing now does not have the same potential to create growth in the future as it does in the past. So I guess the problem I have with this is how good anyone is at predicting future innovations. But all I can tell you is, looking at robotics, at nanotechnology, particularly at genomics, particularly at genomics, and particularly at artificial intelligence, I have to wonder what these people really are thinking or how much real imagination they have. We all know about the innovation pessimists. We all bring out these famous quotes about people who have just been shockingly wrong in their predictions and that nothing has really changed and, oh, these innovations don't really make a lot of difference here. Uh, I love Lord Kelvin, uh, who is a man who should have known better, even in 1895. Uh, but I don't want to dwell on that. I want to dwell on the fact that you have to believe, if, you're not, if you don't believe that innovation, th these disruptive technologies are going to transform things, I don't think you're paying much attention to what's going on. I don't think you quite understand it. Look, 50 years from now, we're going to have red brick buildings, okay? We're still going to have human beings. We'll probably still have some way to communicate with each other, okay? So it'll still look similar, but it's all going to be very, very different. And if you can see that, you're not paying attention. It's IT innovation, we know that they're making everything more efficient. That's just on the surface, though. We know smart self-driving cars, we can go through 50 pages of this thing, are going to reduce commute times by 30%. How is that going to change productivity? How is that going to influence things? We know innovations in genetic engineering are going to reduce and possibly eliminate many diseases of old age. Doesn't curing cancer excite anybody anymore? Oh, we always had cancer. Well, maybe we'll find, people will die of something else, maybe. They'll be 100 years old, they'll fall, you know, so what, you cure cancer. Is that really, is that your attitude? I can't help but be excited about the future. And I don't know why people don't think that it's going to be better somehow. So I can only say, People need to have a little more imagination. Try to figure out what the transistor of the future is. And people like the people here in this room that are thought leaders have to do something to counteract this wave of pessimism. You've got to believe in the future. You've got to believe things are getting better. I don't know about you. I'm not getting up in the morning if I think to myself, you know, Bob, the world's going to hell and it ain't getting any better. This is it. We're going down from here.